can only imagine when that day comes. God bless you for being here today. Isn't it a beautiful day? Okay, some are semi-conscious and they haven't really awakened to the fact they're, they're all concerned about the path of totality. Uh, Joe and I were talking at the back, and it seems like everybody's a prophet these days. If you get on the Internet, they're, they're predicting everything from the zombie apocalypse to, you know, to I don't know what all. Um, but I suspect that the, other than people getting out and um, getting impatient, running into each other in their cars, other than that, it'll probably go along about like most other days. And I hope they don't even, I hope everybody's patient and, and mellow and just has a good time uh, being around their neighbors. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Our Father, we thank Thee for the new day. We're thankful for the opportunity to come together, and we're thankful for the Psalter and for all the wonderful poetry and the magnificent songs that were recorded in Your name. And we're especially grateful that the Psalter hits upon almost or virtually every problem that human beings struggle with. And so we can receive help and, and guidance and coping with the world as it is and help to be faithful until, until we awaken in your presence. Continue with us in the study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In, the, in a broad, broad sweep in Psalm 71, I had entitled it, Remember Me When I Am Old. Now, I know for a bunch of young people just starting out like are gathered in this room, that might seem like something that you won't need for a long time. But uh, for those that uh, have reached the, uh, the age where uh, they can, without insult, uh, be told that they're old, it's kind of like a doctor I heard that told somebody, uh, congratulations, you're old. And the man said, well, yeah, but what causes this? He said, I just told you, you're old. And, uh, and so uh, a lot of help he was. But in a broad sweep, the, lighter, the writer looks back and he looks forward reaching back in his vision to the early days of his youth, and then he's going to leap forward to old age and make a giant step, if you will, across that whole experience, which is called life. And from his youth, he has lived with trust in God, and he looks ahead to his final years and wants to finish his journey with a living faith in the Lord and arrive at the end surrounded and, and uh, in, enveloped in God's gracious care. That's, uh, I imagine, the sentiments of most people in the room. And uh, those are noble sentiments. And the words of this psalm, as a lament, or parts of it as a lament, echo several other psalms. Verses 1 to 3 uh, are similar, maybe even drawn from uh, Psalm 31, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Some themes you'll have recur, and and writers will do that. They'll just pick uh, here and there. Uh, The writer and the date of the composition and the circumstances, the precise circumstances of the writing is unknown to us. Uh, It's another one of those uh, that sounds like David's life. It is the only this psalm and Psalm 43 are without a title in book two. We've been, uh, and book two is the Jews counted it uh, several weeks now. And so perhaps he wrote this towards the end of his life. Maybe when Adonijah uh, was seeking to assume the throne shortly after his death, you know, when a, a great leader like that inevitably begins to falter, like some of our leaders. Uh, I remember Mr. Reagan began to falter. And uh, the current president, of course, uh, it's kind of pitiful to watch sometimes on television uh, as, as he struggles, with the, obviously, with the infirmities of age. Uh, I'm not a politician, but uh, that's, a, that's a bad place to be in and getting weak, you know, because everybody's, the knives come out. So to speak, maybe not, not literally, of course, but they're all lining up, jockeying for position, and uh, waiting for you to go on and die. You know, it's kind of a gloom, gloomy uh, situation. But he is this psalmist 
I'm going to say David, uh, just for ease, uh, has enjoyed a life of walking with God in faith and commitment. And he's received numerous blessings throughout his life, which he, he just graciously and happily acknowledges. And from the summit of his years, he's going to make several requests and uh, express the unique concerns, really, of all people facing the sunset of life. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, at some point you turn around or look in the mirror, or, you know, you have this realization maybe you're going in for a major surgery, and uh, it, it dawns on you there really is a terminus to this wonderful, beautiful thing we call life. And that is a sobering thought. But for those that have walked with God, uh, it's not an unhappy thought. I remember when my dad was going in for major, major problems, uh, that he survived and lived a few years past that. But I remember uh, my brother was quite upset. and Everybody was upset. But Dad looked at him and not with any uh, rebuke in it at all, but he said, son, I'm not afraid to die. Uh, you know, he said, if these doctors can help me and, uh, you know, I can go on and, and live and be with my family, that'd be fine. But this is time to go. I'm good with it. And he was. Um, and so those things are, are things that we, we think about or we should think about. In verses 1 through 3 of seven, uh, Psalm 71, he begins, and it's entitled, A Refuge in God. We just place that on it. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. And so these verses, as I noted earlier in the introduction, were almost identical to Psalm 31, um, 1 to 3. Uh, cheered by the remembrance of mercy's past, he expresses the, his solid, rock-solid trust in God and ask the Lord to rescue him from a current difficulty. Uh, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. He has, uh, he has known Yahweh as a refuge from his early days. And he pleads for God to remain a refuge for him and for his nation. And placing himself under God's care, he prays that he will not be disappointed or disgraced. If it's David, then he's God's man. We have to keep in mind it's not just David. Uh, David is, is central. He is, he is the man that the, the whole kingdom is built around. And, and so the government agencies and all of that, these people are loyal to him. When somebody else comes to the throne, it's going to be a sea change. You know how that, that is. And so um, he asked the Lord to be hide him in a great shelter, acknowledging God as the God of all righteousness. He says, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. He knows that God will be righteous with those who trust him. And he's fully aware that God cannot lie or practice deceit and betrayal. What did Julius Caesar say uh, when he was set upon by his friends? You remember? In Latin, it's et tu, Brute. Brutus, of all those guys that, that murdered him, uh, was, he thought, his close friend. Well, God's not like men. He's higher than man. He, he's not capable of that kind of deception. Uh, I say not capable. It's just not within his nature. Uh, he would not be who he is if he had that capacity. And so his urgent re request is to, uh, for God to bend low and, and listen and answer uh, it, it with his salvation request that he makes. And only... Uh, by being his rock of habitation, his fortress, if you will, a uh, hiding place, can God be to him the protection that he needs? He says, be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. Uh, and you think about David's life. He was out there in the, 
in the wild, wild country with Saul's army uh, chasing him from here to there. And apparently he was really good at uh, unconventional warfare, and, uh, and they never did catch him. And, of course, the providence of God certainly figured prominently in that. But it, it flavors his language. He sees God as his rock of habitation or his dwelling. And he, will, he says he will dwell in him for his shelter. There, there is no other refuge. There is no other fortress to which he can flee when danger threatens. Has anything changed, really, ultimately? I mean, uh, you know, they're talking today, they, uh, what they do in these uh, wars that lead up to big wars is they try out their equipment wherever it is they get engaged. Currently, this is my opinion, Ukraine and some other places. But if you got a system that's, that's just uh, really, really, uh, the, the, you know, very effective, what are the other guys going to do on the other side? They're going to build something to, uh, to either to answer it or to overcome it, right? Been doing that for thousands of years. So is there really, I mean, is there really safety in great armaments? Now, I'm not saying abandon the military and, and, you know, just throw the doors open, but I'm just saying where the place where we need to, to come down is in the Lord and in the will of God. That's where there's real safety. Um, God has chosen to be the refuge for his people. And, and so there is no refuge other than him, really. He said, you have, you have given me uh, a given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. You know, God, if you will, has given himself commandment. He's uttered it to save his trusting servants who call upon him for salvation. And uh, in David's case, many times that had to do with physicality. But ultimately, what is he talking about? You sold, isn't it? You know, that part of you which will live on. You're, you are not. Uh, I mean, you are partly physical and partly spiritual. And that which is spiritual uh, has no end. It had a beginning, but it doesn't have an ending. Uh, you will always be somewhere. And, of course, for us, the, the mission is to be where the Lord is. And, and so God has given himself commandment to save his trusting servants who call upon him for salvation. Uh, could he be uh, referring to the inclusive promise that God made to Abraham uh, back in Genesis 12? Uh, regardless of the promise that's meant, the the heartwarming truth that underlies uh, it is this. God bound himself to be present for his people, and he promises to be their invincible rock and their fortress. You know, that there is, unfortunately, a whole lot of timidity, I, I believe too much timidity, among the people of God because, you know, we want to not say anything because somebody might get mad. Somebody might get upset. The truth is, you know, it's, it's kind of prickly, isn't it? Uh, do you find it to be? I, I mean, the truth will save us, but it also will point out flaws and, and, and uh, problems and things that have to be corrected. And people uh, tend to be resistant to that kind of thing, do they not? You know, our, our culture today is, is very fast moving away from the undergirding principles, our founding fathers. And this is not a political thing. This, this has to do with, uh, with reality. Our founding fathers were wise enough to know that you cannot have a, a we the people government, a self-governing society, unless and until you have the preponderance of the people being righteous people, people that will keep their word, people that will uh, will help their neighbors, people that will refrain from bringing harm or unfair, uh, they won't do, uh, take unfair advantage of those that are around them. I had the opportunity one time at Fred Hardeman to hear uh, Paul Harvey came. He was going to be their 
a fundraising speaker, and none of the students had enough money to, of course, to go to that. But uh, Mr. Harvey volunteered. He said he'd like to do a question answer session with students if it was all right, and they could invite the media if they wanted to. He spent three hours. But I, it struck me uh, something that he said. He said, You cannot have a banking system like we use very effectively unless you have basically honest people. What do you mean by that? Well, the bank, of course, doesn't keep the money. You hope they put that money out. At interest, right? And it's not their money, it's their customers' money. And so the whole system is dependent on neighbors doing what they say they're going to do. But if you buy an automobile on credit, that you're going to pay for it. If you borrow money to go to college, that you're going to pay it back or a mortgage or whatever. And that, that comes back to just being honest, being who God calls us to be. And, and uh, that's a prerequisite for being able to call upon him. And he comes in verses 4 through 6 and talks about hoping in God. Rescue me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and the ruthless man, for you are my hope. O oh Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you, I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Verse 4, he, he is thinking of a problem that in his heart of hearts needs immediate attention. So he pleads with the Lord for rescue out of the hand of wicked, and the grasp of the wrongdoer, and the schemes of the ruthless man. And we don't, we don't know who his enemies were. We don't know why they were a threat to him, but they are described by three terms. They're wicked, they're wrongdoers, and they're ruthless. Uh, my dad, would, uh, he would sum all that up, trifling sorry. The men were strong. They're harsh, and they're devoted to evil. They, don't, they do not mind taking unfair advantage. They do not mind and uh, will willingly run over anybody that gets in their way. They're about self. And uh, they're as hard as they are largely because they can't even trust one another. You see that uh, across the country as the... Leadership has fallen down on enfor enforcing the laws, and you see a lot of a lot of shooting and a lot of violence in the streets. But now there's a large portion of that are outlaws killing outlaws. We can't trust one another. They're ruthless men, and that's the kind of person that the psalmist is talking about. In verse five, he looks to God as his only hope. For you are my hope. Oh, Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. All through the years of his life, he has been one of those that's had faith that God would bless him and protect him if, as he walked with God. In verse 6, God has been the one on whom he has leaned and, and in whom he's found support that he's needed. And uh, he uses our public from his mother's womb until now. By you, I have been sustained from my birth. And so he has always trusted in God as far as he can remember. And God has sustained him and supported him and held him fast. And he could see God's gracious hand upon his life all the way back uh, to the beginning. Everything that he has uh, been and everything that he had had uh, he owes to God. You took me from my mother's womb. Uh, people today, and, and that's all right, we accommodatively, God lets us call it ours, but it's really all his, isn't it? And the psalmist recognizes the source of blessings. Uh, you know, the, the fact that he'd been able to do what he had done, and, and of course, uh, no doubt, a very skillful 
administrator, very skillful soldier. Um, but those those are, are gifts. I mean, he had to learn, but he had the capacity. The capacities he came here with are gifts that God arranges for us. You took me from my mother. When he was unable to care for himself, God looked after him. God has been his hope, has been his confidence, been his strong refuge. And his, his joyful praise will have only one note. God has been good to me. Uh, you know, we have a member here who's in a wheelchair and has been for several years. And at the latter end of life, and whenever you're around her, well, isn't it wonderful? Isn't this wonderful to have family and all, you know, all of that? And it is. But not everybody sees it. A lot of people walk around on two strong legs, you know, or complaining and whining about something doesn't amount to anything. And then you got this uh, saint over here who's advanced in years and whose capacities are being diminished as uh, the terminus comes. And nothing but a, a, a prayer on her lips and a song in her heart because God has been good. And he has been good. Uh, and so he says, my praise is continually to you. He's, he's going to continue to give thanks for God's kind providence that's brought him to where he is. Uh, you know, everybody can look back at their own life, and, and we can't discern as clearly as a psalmist could. But there are times that you think, I, I don't know how, that, how in the world that could have come about. Oh, I do. A gracious God. In time of old age, he comes to that, verses 7 through 11. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails, for my enemies have spoken against me. And those who watch for my life have consulted together, saying God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there's no one to deliver. So that kind of thing's been going on a long, long time. You know, it's been going on a long time. You want the top job? <laughs> anybody want the top job? Anybody want to be, you know, uh, the president? Anybody want to be, you know, the big boss or something like that? And maybe not in, in terms of carnal arms, you know, that kind of warfare. but. Warfare nevertheless, and that people connive and, and do all the things that they do. And as the, as the leader weakens, he's, he gets in this place. It's, and God's been good to him, and those around him have noticed that. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. You, I think of Daniel, taken captive, technically a slave, but... You know, as the empires changed, they always kept Daniel in a key position. Why? Because God smiled on him. And those emperors may have been pagans. They were heathens. But they had enough sense to see that God was with this man. And they needed him. So they, they protected him and elevated him to a high position. Who was another young man like that? Yeah, they, they feared the God that Daniel worshipped. Uh, they didn't convert, but they certainly had respect for him. Joseph was another such man. And uh, you, you look at his life, and oh, man, it's going terrible. He's been sold into slavery by his brothers. and You know, oh, I just horrible, horrible, horrible. And it was. But through that, he grew, and he, and he got stronger and stronger, and he ends up being basically the prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. 
You know, you look at that on paper, so that can't happen. And there are a lot, there are people that reject the Bible, so no, that, that couldn't happen. Yeah. And so, uh, but, but it could and it did happen. Uh, David is an unlikely figure. Uh, but God brought him to where he did, and he said, I, I, I'm marvel. I am a marvel to many for my strong refuge. You know, he has even become a marvel to those around him. And the word here is, is a rare word, and it means a, a, a wonder, a sign, a portent. Uh, his, his statement can be interpreted in one of three ways. Uh, within the language, it, it may mean that the writer, like Job, in his affliction, has remained faithful and thus become a marvel to those that have witnessed his suffering. On the other hand, it could mean that those who knew him regarded his trial as a divine chastisement. In that sense, he would be considered a prophetic wonder. Or it could mean that in all of his persecutions, he was blessed so that no harm fell to him. Now, there's nothing in the context that would indicate that, it, that these things have befallen him because of a divine chastisement. So it's probably, probably one and three uh, that's taken place. Uh, and so those who have known the psalmist are aware of the amazing deliverances that he's experienced. And they stand in awe of, of what they've seen. I mean, you think about David being in the cave where Saul's sleeping and cutting off the bottom of his garment and leave it there like, you know, if I wanted you, I'd got you. Uh, you know, that's, that's an amazing thing. They chase that young man all over, all over, and uh, never did find him. I read about uh, uh, Geronimo a long time ago in this country and said that they put 7,000 crack cavalry out there to go and get Geronimo. And so they thought maybe they saw the dust from their ponies once or twice. And the Apache was in his home turf. And they never, uh, Geronimo quit when he got ready to quit. Uh, and so I'm not saying God was with him, but I'm saying he was a superb uh, gorilla. And well, so was David. And God was with him. Uh, and so he had, what he's experienced with God, uh, he can do nothing but praise the Lord. You know, he looks up. He, you know, a lot of people will be blessed in some way, and you know, you don't, let, you won't hear a word of thanks to the Lord. But you know, whatever we accomplish, it's good. Whatever we overcome, we need to be very careful that we remember from whom. These blessings flow. Uh, it's, it's the same source the psalmist had. And because of God's greatness and God's goodness, he wants to, and not wants to, he is giving himself to praising the Lord. He said all day long. Now, that doesn't mean all day long without any interruption, but frequent. That he j just, day through the day, he's praising God. Give thanks to the Lord. In verse 9, the years have taken their toll on the writer. Who does that happen to? Everybody. Yes, thank you, Gene. Yeah, everybody. Uh, you know, some people are, are genetically blessed, and, uh, and they, they run on longer than, than average, but it falls, you know, within... Uh, a perimeter, therefore, scoring 10, if perhaps by strength, 10 more. And that pretty well gets it. There are a few, you know, but that pretty well winds it up. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we were built for. But those years have taken a toll on him. And he doesn't have the capacities that he once did. And, uh, you, you know, I'm, I feel like, personally, I'm just solid, you know, that I'm, I'm pretty good. I think I told you about before, after one of the storms, one of my neighbors, he's a lineman for Chico, and I was out there moving pieces of trees that had been chunked up for me, 
And uh, I thought I was doing real good and got up next to that 22-year-old and, you know, I mean, <laughs> what did that boy eat for breakfast, you know? Uh, and, and he'd move things and not even grunt, you know? Uh, that was the, the vigor of you. Uh, good, good young man, good neighbor. Uh, and it wasn't nothing doing, but he's going to help me. And, and so, you know, I was kind of like, well, I don't need that. <laughs> Before we got through, I was proud that he was out there. So uh, his declining body forces of the psalmist has forced him to look toward the end of his life, forced him to come to grips with, with what is coming. And that, that's not a bad thing, is it? You know, man ought to, ought to make some arrangements for the time that, that he uh, goes to sleep here and awakens in the presence of the one we've served all our lives. And so he's, he's looked, and he pleads here for God's continued grace. Doesn't ask him to, to make him young again. He, you know, he knows better than that. But that God will be gracious to him. Do not cast me off in time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fall, fails. You know, his prayer is that, that God's not going to abandon him in his old age. When his strength fails and his body wears out, well, if, if you're walking in the light as he is in the light, is there any chance God's going to abandon you? None whatsoever. There's a couple of you that are sitting here I've, I've seen in very low uh, circumstances in terms of physicality when really everything's on the line. And God didn't. God didn't abandon, and he wouldn't have abandoned my brethren had, he called them on. I said, no, it's time for you to come on home. Uh, he's not going to do that. We walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us, and thus we will find acceptance in his presence. That's his promise. It's not a man-made promise. That's God's promise. And his, the psalmist's prayer is that God's not going to abandon him in his old age. You know, people begin to get fearful have doubts. I, we've had a few brethren faithful all their lives, but right down on the end, they got frightened and would stay at home, wouldn't get out much. You know, I've just seen that happen to people. Uh, and that's, that's a sad thing to see. And others uh, I'll read about a lady, she's not even a member of the church, her and her grandson are on a, a, a tour to visit the seven continents. She's only 93, you know, <laughs> uh, climbing mountains and, and just, it's just, it's, wow. She's one of those exceptional, exceptional people. But you read through that article, a lot of it is one's attitude, and uh, particularly if one is a servant of God. In verse 10, it is precarious to grow old, especially in the presence of real enemies. Uh, for my enemies have for, uh, spoken against me, and those who watch for my life have consulted together. You know, if, if David is the writer, I, bl I believe he very well could be, and probably is, we can understand the intrigue that was unfolding near the end. And his enemies would be quick to take advantage of his, of his weakened uh, capacities uh, and failing power. And you know, when, when one's physical prowess dissipates to a certain degree, that affects our capacity to think and to plan and to strategize and all, all of that because we're just fading. Uh, and, and that's a natural process. Uh, as he approached the consummation of his life, he recognized the possibility of that his foes would be saying, well, God's forsaken him, pursue and seize him. Well, there is no one to deliver. Wrong. That's their perception, but it has uh, has no basis in, in uh, fact. Or it's not true. Maybe they'd looked up on his old age as an indication that God had forsaken him, and that no one would be present to defend him. Uh, if it's David, though, if you go back and remember his career career, he had 600 mighty men. You ought to read about that crew sometime. And they were fiercely loyal to the king. Incredible soldier. 
And uh, so you had to walk through that. And, uh, you know, with the life that he lived, you, you can expect that there were people around him that were just as loyal. And so these enemies would certainly be ready to accuse him of being a sinner worse than themselves in order to justify their evil course of actions. And you'll, you see that today with some of the conflicts out there. It's still kind of thing going on. Well, you're another one. You, know, you did this, you did that. Well, you're another one. That's why we, that's why we had to, to bomb your, the rockets at you or something like that. Go, you know, they all justify themselves. That, uh, that we're the good guys. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Who decides who's the good guy? The Lord does, right. And so uh, these people, you know, they no doubt will do what they do, but they're not going to be able to understand his faith in God, and they're not going to understand God's mercy toward him. In verses 12 through 16, uh, the, the gist of, the prayer becomes, God, may God be near me. Uh, oh, God, do not be far from me. Oh, my God, hasten to my help. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. But as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. So he's, he's given the credit and the praise to the one that deserves it. He's been a, He's been a, a loyal servant, but that's what he's been, a servant. You remember when they tried to uh, pray to the angel? What did he do? He said, whoa, I too am a servant. You know, stand up, stand up. Don't. Uh, he was very careful uh, not to take away from the Lord. And this psalmist is not. They're going to take away from him either. In light of his station in life, he voices here a plaintive plea for God to draw near to him. Oh, God, do not be far from me. Oh, my God, hasten to my help. Uh, I remember, and I tell this from time to time, but it's just stuck when the brother Tom Holland was with one of the members that was dying. And the old man as he's sinking away, he begins to sing, Oh, come angel band. And the nurse said, Do you know what he's talking about? I said, Yes, ma'am. I know exactly what he's talking about. You know, I know exactly what's in his heart and in his mind. And uh, who knows what he sees, but that's what he was doing when he breathed his last. And so in, in light of his station in life, he's, he's asking the Lord to be with him. He has prayed for the enemy to be confused. And for God to keep him strong in hope. And the time factor necessitates urgency. He knows, here I am, and these forces are gathered, and I am weak. I can't defend myself. I need your help. Uh, imprecatorily, verse 13, that's a word, in imprecatorily. An imprecation is asking God uh, to intervene and uh, mete out some justice. He asked God to defeat the plans of his enemy. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed uh, because of the evil they're planning. He prays that they may become so embarrassed by, by what they're seeking to do to a righteous man that they will think about their evil anew and repent. That happens sometimes. Yes, Brother Joe. Yeah. 
I have no shame. You find that in the text. I have no shame. I've lost the ability to blush. That is a, a perilous situation for a person, for a congregation, for a state, for a nation. It is a perilous place for humanity to allow, allow themselves to be. But you cannot f- feel, much less acknowledge, uh, you know, People resist so much the three words, I am sorry. Uh, but that takes, that takes a special kind of courage, doesn't it? For somebody uh, to just say outright, to acknowledge, to make no equivocations and no excuses. It, I, I was wrong, and I want you to forgive me. What typically happens in that environment? People usually are willing, are amazingly willing to forgive. But to get to that place is, is hard. And his enemies uh, here uh, are hard, hard men. And, you know, uh, he asked God to intervene. And so I hope we ha- haven't come to that point. Now, there's, there's a, there is a element within society that are clearly there. There are always going to be some. But if you, if you allow that to go unchecked, unchallenged, it's going to take you to a bad, bad place. It'll take you to Sodom and Gomorrah. It'll take you to some of these evil empires uh, that God used to punish his people prior to punishing them. And so it, it, it'll do that. Of the decadence of the Roman Empire, that's what happened to them. They fell in on themselves. They fell apart from within. Uh, somebody finally came in and cleaned up, you know, and, and wiped out the mess. But, uh, you know, it, it wasn't that they were invaded by a superior force at all. It's what they did to themselves. And that's the most dangerous situation any society uh, ever faces. And, and because of the evil, they're planning. He, he prays that God, let them just be ashamed of themselves. And putting himself and his enemies in the hands of God, he pleads that he might be in God's hand of mercy and that his enemies might be under his hand of judgment. Uh, verse 14, he will, he will let God deal with his enemies, but he will give himself to the worship of the Lord. Don't you wish uh, people that we see out there that just seems like if you get in our urban areas sometimes, uh, you just think, boy, did everybody just get up mad? You know, the way they drive, the way they are, they're just, you know, they're agitated and, and uh, they get to being violent with each other over some little minor thing. And he, here he is, and he says, I'm going to put myself in God's hands and I'm going to do his business and I'm going to let him take care of that other bunch. Well, he wasn't in a position to do it at that point. He had been in the past, but he's not now. So he, he resolves that uh, he's going to worship the Lord. But as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. He resolves to wait in the confident hope of faith. And he's going to add to the number of praises that are given to God's righteousness and salvation. You know, I'm going I'm to do more than I've been doing. The New American Standard has yet more and more, but the Hebrew literally says, and I have added to your praise. And so the idea is that of increase, either way you go with it. And he wanted to expand his praise for the Lord. Now, this is a praise God kind of a man. He is God's man. But he knows that you cannot, you cannot overdo on acknowledging the greatness of our Lord. And because God is righteous in his hatred of sin and righteous in his fulfillment of his promises, he's given us salvation. Uh, Verse 15, praising God is a full-time task uh, for his kindnesses toward us are too numerous to count. Uh, You know, I still, I marvel at, at some of the people I hear that are supposed to know more than the rest of us do. Somebody gave them a platform, put them on TV, and they run this country down. And there are problems. There are serious problems. 
But how many other countries are people breaking the law to get into? You know, uh, there are a few, but they're not a bunch. And great preponderance of those, I saw a gentleman interviewed yesterday that has uh, a Viet Cajun restaurant in Houston. It's well thought of. And, and he's just talking about when his father, when they escaped from Vietnam and came to the United States, he says, one place that my dad wanted our family to be. And of course, they're, they're prospering, and, and he's got his kids and his grandkids, and you know how they, they have strong families, and uh, they're doing well in this country. And, uh, you know, that's what you like to see with an immigrant that goes somewhere that, that, they, that they love, where they are, and wherever the person lives. Um, for the advantages that have been given to them. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. With his mouth, his daily speech, and his singing, he's going to tell all that God has done for him. And, of course, as we've gone through this Psalter, so many of them, uh, David wrote, and he does that uh, just extensively. Now, for I do not know the sum of them. In other words, I would put it all out there if I knew it, but there's, there's more to tell than I know, and he knew a lot. And after announcing his resolve, uh, he must be factual about the challenge before him. The acts of God's pardoning mercy uh, must be seen as multitudes and waves of his goodness that cannot be numbered. And I think about every day when you wake up and can go, what a blessing that is. And when you turn on that little faucet, and lo and behold, there's water. What a blessing that is. And, you know, on and on and on. We come into town, don't have to walk, don't have to try to catch a about half wild horse and saddle him up and ride in on that. Don't even have to ride on a bicycle. You can get in a car that is self pale and ride on blacktop road. My father, years ago, we were going up to my grandmother's on the, on the state highway, concrete highway. He said, when I was a child, if we'd have walked out on this, we'd have thought we was on another planet. Absolutely wouldn't have, wouldn't have had any frame of reference. He was old enough to remember when there weren't very many cars in Webster County, Mississippi. I mean, there were, certainly weren't roads and bridges like they have now. And so uh, you you expand that exponentially as to what God is doing and continues to do. And you've heard me say it, but it's still uh, something people ought to do, even if they don't raise what they eat. They ought to go out and see where it's produced. Because it's produced in the ground. And God does it. And he does it every year. And most years will give you Far, far in a way more than you put into it. Far more than you put into it. Uh, not that you don't have to put something into it. He won't go out there and pick it for you. He won't bring it into the house and prepare it and can it for you and put it up somewhere. He won't do that. But he puts it there. Well, thank you for being here today. Thank you for us getting into this psalm and we'll finish it. Lord willing, next time, and go on to 72.